The essence of the new form of warfare unleashed by the German armed forces with the invasion of Poland on September 1, 1939, lay in surprise, speed and paralysis of the enemy, such that beyond a certain point he no longer possessed the capacity or the will to fight. However, even Napoleon would not have seen in this anything other than what he himself had always sought to realise in his own campaigns. After all, was not the campaign of 1805, in which he broke the armies of Austria and Russia at Austerlitz, not brought about by these very same principles? In this, even Heinz Guderian, Germany's foremost proponent of armoured warfare, would have surely agreed. The real difference between the two ages lay not in ideas as to how to achieve victory, but the means available to do so. The onset of mechanised warfare in the Great War and the technological developments that took place between the wars now enabled adventurous minds to realistically contemplate the destruction of the enemy in rapid lightning wars, where the instrument of victory lay in mobile forces formed of tanks and supporting arms. While the evident success of German arms in Poland, France, Russia and the Western Desert in the first years of the Second World War has given precedence to the panzer arm of the German army, what is very clear is that the tanks were the cutting edge of what came to be an incredibly professional and finely honed all-arms team. This was the difference between the likes of Guderian, Rommel and Manstein, who helped realise German military success in the opening years of the war, and their allied counterparts. They not only thought in terms of the arms of the army cooperating to achieve an objective, but also brought in the dimension of air power as well. It was this grasp of all arms warfare that proved so disastrous for the armies of Poland, France, Great Britain and the Soviet Union. The Allied officers were all schooled in the idea of the independent operations of the different arms of service on the battlefield. Their inadequate grasp of the theory of armoured warfare was to receive bitter and repeated confirmation on the battlefields of North Africa. Neither the British Army nor the RAF had attempted to develop relationships that matched the very close cooperation that existed between the new Luftwaffe and the German Army. Rommel was repeatedly to observe that it was the failure of the British to embrace the notion of a battle as a combined arms affair that often gave victory to the Africa Corps. But it was the genius of the German commanders to grasp that the essence of modern warfare lay in the exploitation of the technology that had emerged out of the furnace of the Great War. In doing so, they acquired an expertise that they were repeatedly to demonstrate right down to Germany's defeat in 1945. Vital to the ability of the Panzer divisions to achieve maximum impact in their assault on the enemy wherever they chose to attack, lay the need for intelligence of that enemy. The eyes and ears of the all-arms team that made up German mobile formations were the armoured cars of the Alfklarungsabteilung, the reconnaissance battalions that roamed far ahead of the onrushing Panzer formations. The Germans produced a range of armoured cars from 1933 onwards, which served them well throughout the conflict. Equally vital to the rapid movement of the Panzer spearheads were the armoured personnel carriers, light tractors towing field howitzers, self-propelled anti-aircraft weapons and prime movers towing the heavy artillery, ready to be deployed to deal with heavy enemy resistance. Most were half-tracked vehicles, a category in which the German army made much investment between the wars. But it was the radio communications nets that moved forward with the Panzers and mounted in armoured cars and half-tracks that allowed the likes of Guderian a degree of command and control over his troops unknown to Napoleon, the significance of which, however, he would have grasped in an instant. In 1932, the Reichswehr issued a specification for a light four-wheeled armoured car to be employed for reconnaissance purposes by the cavalry regiments of the German army. The resultant KFZ-13 built by the Adler Company was at best an expedient. Classified as obsolete by the Second World War, the KFZ-13 nevertheless saw service in the Polish campaign. Its retention through to the opening stages of the Russian campaign is the measure of the industry's inability to satisfy the German army's demand for production of the newer purpose-built armoured cars. The smallest and lightest of the new generation of the German army's programme of Einheits or standard armoured cars was the Panzer Spähwagen 221. 
The 221 was developed to serve in the reconnaissance detachments of the light, motorised infantry and panzer divisions and entered service in 1937, some 339 being built before production of the larger engine Model B was terminated in May 1940. Although the thickness of the armour was no different to the Adler at a maximum of 8mm, the 221 derived a greater degree of protection by virtue of its being angled on the body. Likewise, armament was very light, comprising a single MG-34 machine gun. The 221 was employed by the German army in all its major campaigns, from France, on the steppes of Russia, and amidst the sandy wastes of the Western Desert with the Africa Corps. More often than not, it was the deficient armament of the 221 that led to its employment alongside its more heavily armed stablemate, the SDKFZ-222 seen here. While they shared essentially the same chassis and body design, the 222 was designed as a weapons carrier for divisional reconnaissance units and was equipped with a two-man, albeit very cramped, ten-sided turret mounting a 20mm KWK-30 or 38 automatic cannon the latter being derived from the weapons carried as armament on the Messerschmitt 109 fighter of the Luftwaffe. Secondary armament was an MG-34. In keeping with German Army doctrine for the operation of reconnaissance detachments equipped with armoured cars, it was never envisaged that they would, by design, engage in offensive operations with more powerfully armed enemy units. Speed and flexibility were deemed to be the essential virtues of reconnaissance vehicles, and the armament they carried was to be sufficient only to allow them to engage enemy forces of a similar strength. It was assumed that rapid withdrawal would be the order of the day where possible, when it was clear enemy forces encountered were much stronger. Thus the 20mm cannon was to remain the heaviest weapon to be mounted on all types of reconnaissance armoured cars, until the advent of the 75mm support version of the eight-wheel 223 in late 1942, and the 50mm turret armed Puma in 1943. Nevertheless, in the first half of the war, the 20mm cannon armament was quite adequate to deal with most of the enemy forces engaged. Although the 222 served in all theatres of war, the decision to terminate production in June 1943 stemmed from a desire to equip the reconnaissance detachments in Russia with a more capable machine. As the 222 was only equipped with a short-range radio, it often operated with a specialised radio variant designated the 223, equipped with a frame aerial. The 223 was introduced alongside the 222 and carried long-range radio sets. Defence was provided by an MG-34 in a small turret, equipped with mesh anti-grenade screens, also fitted to the 221 and 222. Produced in 1940 were two further specialised radio variants on the 222 chassis, the SD KFZ 260 and 261, for employment by signals troops serving in panzer units. Tasked to supplement the intelligence on enemy dispositions supplied by Army Cooperation Aircraft, armoured car units would range to the fore of the advancing panzer spearheads. As many as 42 of the lighter 221s and 222s and associated radio vehicles might operate up to 60 miles in advance of the leading tanks. Indeed, for many Allied and Soviet troops, their first contact with oncoming German forces would have been a brush with these fast-moving armoured reconnaissance units. A rarity among German armoured vehicles, the SDKFZ-247, stands outside the sequence of the light armoured cars seen hitherto and is more properly described as an armoured staff car come armoured personnel carrier. Those illustrated in this sequence are the 4x4 model, which entered production in July 1941, replacing the earlier six-wheeled variant of the 247 manufactured in 1937. A reconnaissance battalion commander in his 247 leads a small column of supporting 222 armoured cars, one 223 radio car, through a French town during the occupation of Vichy France in November 1942. The six-wheeled SD KFZ 231 series, comprising the basic 231 heavy reconnaissance model, the 232 model with frame aerial, and the 263 heavy radio car 
was the first of the new generation of armoured cars entering service with the German army in 1932. The basis of this vehicle was the 6x4 light cross-country chassis that the companies of Daimler-Benz, Majerus and Bussing Nag were already producing for commercial lorries. Although this was demanded by the army for reasons of economy, it was rapidly seen to have been a false saving in as much as the 231 series was handicapped from birth by technical limitations that was to reduce its service life. Production of the type lasted just four years and the design was phased out in 1937. Weighing between five and six tonnes, the 231, like the 222, was equipped with the main armament of a 20mm cannon and machine gun in the turret. Although by 1939 the six-wheeled 231 series had been superseded in the heavy reconnaissance role by the more sophisticated eight-wheeled armoured cars in the German army, they nevertheless saw limited use in the opening year of the conflict. Employment in Poland and France only confirmed its limitations as a cross-country vehicle due to its heavy weight and low engine power. Thereafter, it was turned over to training units. Although a less than successful design, the heavy six-wheel series played a formative role in developing the operational techniques employed by the reconnaissance battalions in the pre-war period, and first applied in the occupations of Austria and Czechoslovakia. Best known of all German armoured cars was the heavy eight-wheel series introduced in 1936. While this new design series inherited the earlier six-wheeled roll designation, with the three variants on the eight-wheel chassis retaining the SDKFZ 231, 232 and 263 number sequence, it was distinguishable from the former by the addition of the suffix 8RAD. Choosing to opt on this occasion for a purpose design chassis, the eight-wheel series was without doubt the most sophisticated armoured car in the world. Although the chassis of the 8 Rand was built by Bussing Nag, oversight of the project and manufacture of the armoured bodies was undertaken by Deutschenberg of Kiel, and the final assembly the responsibility of the F. Shishau Company of Elbing. Between 1936 and September 1943, a total of 847 machines left the production line. Eight-wheeled armoured cars of the 231 series saw service from the Polish campaign through to the defeat of Nazi Germany. Allocation of this heavy armoured car was dependent upon the formation operating it. The largest number served in the Panzer formations where each division received an allotment of 12, while a motorised division received six and a lorried infantry brigade just four. These operated in tandem not just with the aforementioned light car series, but also with supporting troops on motorcycles with machine guns mounted on sidecars. The 8RAD 263 employed the hull of the 231 series with the armoured body extended upwards to provide a large crew compartment wherein was carried long-range 100-watt medium-wave radio equipment. Employed by the communications detachments of Panzer motorised divisions, the powerful radio equipment on board allowed the rapid dissemination of new orders following study of the latest intelligence on enemy forces and dispositions. One of the best sequences of film showing armoured cars in action comes from the operations of the reconnaissance detachment of the 1st SS Division Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler during the Balkans campaign in April 1941. A mixed detachment of light 221s and eight-wheel 232 radio cars and 231 standard reconnaissance vehicles is seen moving stealthily through a Greek town where they've been giving chase to retreating British forces. Noteworthy are the names, such as sidelets, placed on some of the vehicles by their crews, a practice that was much less common on German vehicles than found on British or American machines. During this campaign, the reconnaissance detachment of the Leibstandarte was under the command of Sturmbannführer Kurt Mayer, who received the Knight's Cross for this command. Having discovered that the British forces had evacuated by sea, he commandeered a number of fishing boats, loaded them with the advance guard of the detachment, including armoured cars, and followed them, later capturing troops of the 3rd Royal Tank Regiment at Piergos. It was in North Africa that the eight-wheeled armoured cars fully came into their own. 
Contrary to common belief, the Libyan desert is not all deep sand and provides an admirable surface for wheeled and track vehicles to move fairly swiftly. The armoured cars gave sterling service with the Africa Corps. Operation Barbarossa provided the greatest challenge to the armoured car units as they plunged into the depths of Russia, spreading their limited resources across an ever-widening front. Here, a 222 and a 232 of the 11th Panzer Division of Panzer Group Kleist, operating with Army Group South, are ranging deep behind Soviet lines, gathering vital intelligence on Red Army units during the drive towards Kiev in August 1941. It was in Russia that the full benefit of the specially designed chassis of the 8 Rad series was especially appreciated. Russian roads were rarely tarmacked and during the summer storms heavy rain would transform sandy tracks into quagmires. However, the onset of the terrible Russian winter allowed the eight-wheelers to put their all-wheel drive to best possible use. The late version of the 232 replaced the cumbersome frame aerial with a star aerial to the rear of the hull and another aerial on the turret roof. Armoured cars were also on occasions employed for offensive operations as in the case of this group of 222s under the command of a late model 232 firing on guerrilla forces in the mountains of Yugoslavia. The last variant on the 2318 Rad chassis entered production as late as December 1942 and was a direct consequence of the need to provide reconnaissance detachments with their own heavier fire support in the face of increasingly strong Soviet and Allied forces. The first 10 233s were converted from 231-232 stroke chassis returned to Germany for overhaul. Thereafter, another 109 new build vehicles were produced before production was terminated in October 1943. The main armament was the 75mm L24 Stummel cannon. The first 233 detachments entered service in North Africa in late 1942 and were extensively employed in the fighting in Tunisia where this film was shot. Organised into platoons of six vehicles, the 233s would accompany the lighter 222s and 223s, which in this case provides the communications vehicle for this particular reconnaissance sortie. Most of the vehicles involved carry a modicum of foliage to give a degree of protection from eagle-eyed Allied fighter pilots. The 233 normally carried a mixture of 33 high-explosive and armour-piercing rounds, although, as in the case of other armoured vehicles, crews frequently carried more rounds depending upon the sortie and likely opposition. The 233 proved to be an effective and well-liked machine. These 233s of the 1st Panzer Division are in Salonika in Greece in July 1943. The 233s were employed on all fronts and through to war's end. A number of these machines are seen here providing support to a mixed reconnaissance detachment of 222s, 223s and Volkswagen Schwimmwagens operating on the eastern border of Poland. The relief on the crew's faces is apparent as it becomes clear that the column of vehicles coming into view is not the enemy but another reconnaissance detachment returning from its own sortie. Although ordered in August 1940, the long gestation of the new 234 series of heavy armoured cars resulted in the first Puma not leaving the production line at Vusing Nag until September 1943. Although similar in appearance to the 231 series it was designed to replace, the 234 employed a better protected armoured body. Just 101 Pumas were produced, these serving in armoured car companies of four Panzer divisions on both the eastern and western fronts. It was on the latter in service with the Panzer Lair and 2nd Panzer Division in the ferocious fighting in Normandy that this rare film was taken. Operating with the reconnaissance company of the former in the fighting against the US forces around San Lo, the heavily camouflaged Pumas prowled the roads, their turret-mounted 50mm L60 gun giving them a far greater firepower than any German armoured car to date. The fate of Pumas in the Normandy campaign was little different to that of most other German armour following the Allied breakout and destruction of Army Group West in the Falaise pocket.
In production from June 1944 until January 45, 220mm armed 234-stroke-1 heavy armoured cars served in the recce battalions of Panzer and Panzergrenadier divisions. The 234-stroke-3 fulfilled the support role within the reconnaissance units. It mounted the 75mm cannon, which by 1944 was no longer adequate in this role. This led to Hitler demanding this variant be upgunned to mount the more effective 75mm anti-tank gun to enable support units to deal with Allied armour. Following the Anschluss in 1938, the German army inherited 27 ADGZ eight-wheeled armoured cars, then in service with the Austrian army, and allocated a number to the police. 14 ADGZs were employed by an SS police detachment in operations in Danzig on the 1st of September 39, following the German invasion of Poland. Supported by fire from light infantry guns, an SS ADGZ named Sudetenland is seen being used as mobile cover by police to storm the post office building in the city. The ADGZ carried a 20mm cannon and two machine guns. Steyr Dame Le Putsch received a subsequent order for the ADGZ when 25 were produced for service with the SS in 1942 for units engaged in Russia. While the Germans employed many enemy types, one of the best was the Panhard 178 armoured car. A number of these vehicles had been captured in 1940 and taken into service. 43 captured French Panhards were modified for service in Russia as railway protection vehicles. Equipped with rail wheels, they operated in tandem with armoured trains, defending vital supply lines against Soviet partisans. Having made contact with the partisans, the Panhard crew would engage them with their cannon while calling up the armoured train for support. Such was the effectiveness of the wartime eight-wheeled armoured cars that the Bundeswehr chose to employ the same configuration on its new Lynx reconnaissance vehicle in 1975. No combatant employed a greater variety of half-track vehicles during the Second World War than Germany. However, the interest of the German army in these machines predated the rise to power of Adolf Hitler and the subsequent expansion of the Wehrmacht in the years after 1933. Indeed, early examples of such machines were employed in very limited numbers in the Great War. Experience with these Marion bargains and craft prototypes were employed as the basis for the formulation of specifications for half-track types to be used in the program for the motorization of artillery within the Reichswehr as early as 1926. The finalization of this program in 1929 had led to the identification for the need of a range of half-track machines to fulfill mainly tractor tasks. By 1932, the program identified the need for a light half-track weighing five tons, a medium tractor of eight tons, and a heavy machine of 12 tons. However, in the light of the expansion of the Wehrmacht after 1933, the need for two further types was identified, and in 1934, specifications for one-ton and three-ton machines were issued, subsequently becoming two of the most important types to see service in the Wehrmacht. The need for an additional type of very heavy half-track of 18 tons was not finally identified until 1936. The large number of companies brought into the manufacturing program for these half-tracks reads like a who's who of the German automotive industry. Hussing Nag and Daimler-Benz in Berlin, Krauss Maffei of Munich, Farmo of Breslau, DMAG in the Ruhr and Borgvord of Bremen. In the period immediately prior to the outbreak of the war, the German army succeeded in streamlining the number of types being produced so that throughout the period of the conflict, just eight remained in production. Smallest of the wartime half-tracks was the Ketten Kraft Trad, or small motorcycle tractor. Although developed by the NSU company, it derived from work on a vehicle originally developed for the Austrian army. Production of the Ketten Krad began in 1940 and continued at NSU until 1944, by which time they produced some 8,345 of the machines. Although designed ostensibly as a towing vehicle for light anti-tank weapons for airborne troops, first seeing action in the invasion of Crete in 1941, such was the utility of the machine that it was employed extensively by the German army as well. 
The mobility of the Kettenkrad was extremely good and its ability to deal with even the most severe of terrains made it a popular machine. Although driven by its tracks, steering was achieved mainly by the driver turning the front wheel, as with a conventional motorcycle. But at more extreme turning angles, controlled differential steering brakes took over. The ability of the Kettenkrad to deal with a variety of driving conditions is well attested by this film of new machines at the NSU being put through their paces at the factory testing ground. The Kettenkrad served on all fronts from 1941 onwards, and examples captured from the Western Desert by the British were often employed by them. sequence of film illustrating exactly the purpose for which the Ketten Crab was designed comes from the summer of 1943 and a glider reinforcement of paratroops for German forces defending Sicily following the Allied invasion of the island on the 10th of July. First a DFS 230 glider carrying troops alight safely on a beach landing strip followed shortly by a larger Gotha 242. Although the weight of the Kettenkrad was 1.28 tonnes, it was easily transportable by the Gotha. The twin boom layout of the glider allowed the half-track motorcycle to be driven out without difficulty. For paratroops, the Kettenkrad allowed loads just that bit too heavy for a soldier to manhandle efficiently or anti-tank weapons to be towed without difficulty. With the mobility of a tank, the Kettenkrad came into its own in Russia when the late autumn rains came and in the early spring the melt from the severe winter snow transformed the roads into a sea of mud. In 1939 DMAG began production of the one-ton D7 half-track which was to become one of the most numerous and important types employed by the Wehrmacht. The parent company transferred production of the unarmoured machine to other manufacturers to concentrate on the manufacture of the armoured version. Standardised as the STKFZ-10, this half-track saw extensive employment throughout the conflict. The principal variant of the one ton was the SDKFZ-10-4 self-propelled anti-aircraft gun, which had the passenger section replaced with a flatbed on which was mounted a 20mm flak. 610 of this variant were built. By the time the type phased out of production in 1944, 25,000 had been manufactured in a programme embracing plants in Austria, France and Germany. These included Sara Werk in Vienna, Panhard, Renault, Simca, Peugeot and Lorraine in France, and Mechanische Werk of Silesia in Germany. A number of other German companies such as Adler, Bussing Nag and Mayag built the type alongside Panzers and their own half-track types. The appearance of the type remained unchanged throughout its production life, the doorless body being designed as an open troop carrier for eight men, with the soldiers clambering out and over the body to disembark for employment. The adaption of the one-ton chassis to take an armoured body in 1939 led to the appearance of the SDKFZ 250 series, for service in the reconnaissance units of Panzer and motorised divisions. The interior was designed to carry the driver, commander and four troopers. The armour gave the crew protection from small arms fire. Although a number of prototypes of the 250 were tested in Poland, production was delayed and the first machine did not leave the production line until June 1941. The 250 spawned a family of variants. Two can be seen in this footage of the recce unit of the 1st SS Division in France in 1942. The 25010 mounts a Pac-36 and the 253 Radio Command variant a frame aerial. As production of the 250 expanded, film of the type begins to increase. This from the 1942 campaign in southern Russia shows the basic 250 armoured personnel carrier, pack armed and radio versions engaged in the advance on Rostov-on-Don. 
in self-defence, the 250s carried an MG34 mounted on the forward upper hull. Often a second MG34 was carried on the upper rear hull mounting. It can also be seen how the troops of the section also employ their own personal weapons, such as the MP38, for firing from within the vehicle. The prominently displayed swastika flag on the bonnet of this 250 was a necessary recognition device to avoid being strafed by their own aircraft. The light armoured radio half-track STKFZ 253 was one of the most important of the variants and was employed for communications control over motorised formations. Most famous of the one-ton half-tracks was that employed by Erwin Rommel when commander of the Afrika Corps. As the propaganda department made great play of his exploits, his command half-track emblazoned with the name Griff or Griffin was frequently seen in the newsreels. These standard one-ton armoured personnel carriers and supporting 250-10s are part of the force that Hitler ordered to move into and take over southern France following the Anglo-American landings in North Africa in November 1942. Unhappiness with the performance of the four-wheeled 222 armoured car in Russia led to its replacement in mid-1943 with a variant of the 250 half-track mounting exactly the same 20mm armed 10-sided turret. Designated the SDKFZ-259, production began in May 1943. Operated by a crew of three, it carried 100 rounds of 20mm ammunition for its KWK-38 cannon and was provided with a coaxial MG-34 or 42 machine gun. This variant was used by the recce detachments of Army and Waffen-SS Panzer Divisions and motorised formations. 4,250 of the original 250 were produced up until October 1943, when a major redesign of the armour configuration to facilitate easier and more rapid production led to the appearance of the SD-KFZ-250 new model. The most distinctive feature of the new body shape was the inclusion of more flat armour plates. Many of the variants on the old body were continued with the new type, although most completed were of the standard APC body. Service continued to be mainly in the armoured reconnaissance detachments. The rapidly declining war situation in 1944 led to the decision to drop the 250 in favour of the SDKFZ 251. By the time of phase-out in 44, 2,378 of the new 250 had been produced. One of the least publicised of German military vehicles and rarely the subject of substantive newsreel coverage, the three-ton SDKFZ-11 was nevertheless one of the most important produced during the war. This unarmoured three-ton machine holds the distinction of having the largest production run of any unarmoured half-track manufactured during the war, with no fewer than 25,000 being completed. The three-ton chassis was developed by Borgvord of Bremen. Although classified as a light half-track, the three-tonner was primarily employed throughout the conflict as an artillery tractor, its principal load being the 105mm howitzer. In this role, it served on every front where the German army was engaged and the 105mm employed. Less frequently, it also drew the much heavier 88mm Flak 18 and 36, and from 1942 was employed to tow the 75mm Pac-40 anti-tank gun. A further weapon towed by this vehicle were the various sizes of rocket artillery known as Werfers. In common with the manufacture of many half-track vehicles, the production of the three-tonner was spread across a number of companies. While the principal producer remained Borgvord, others include Hanamag, Auto Union, Adler and Skoda of Prague. The SDKFZ-11 reflected standard German half-track design in that its engine was mounted at the front of the vehicle. Steering was effected through the front wheels. The crew, who sat behind the driver, faced inward behind the body shell, which came up to shoulder height when they were seated, providing a modicum of protection from small arms fire and artillery splinters.
The three-tonner proved to be an immensely versatile machine, and from 1943 onwards, its manufacture was deemed to be a matter of priority. Its very effective cross-country performance, even in Russia, led to a number being provided with a flatbed in place of the crew compartment, so that it could be employed for the carriage of medium loads. One of the most important vehicles to see service with the German Army in the Second World War was the SD KFZ 251 armoured personnel carrier. Although based upon the three-ton chassis developed by Borgvord for the SD KFZ 11, manufacture was handed over to the Hanemag company, with the first model, the 251A, leaving the production line in June 1939, a number seeing action in Poland and France. The 251 spawned 23 variants by 1945, two of the earliest being the 2514, used to tow the 105mm howitzer, and the 25110, mounting the Pack 36. This Model B is serving in Russia in 1941, by which time most Panzer divisions had received SPWs, or Schutzen Panzerwagen. However, it was not until 1942 that all Panzer divisions could field SPWs. The Model C entered production in mid-1940. Features to ease production included a flat nose plate and armoured cowls, and this model was produced until September 1943. These Model Cs are taking part in the German counter-offensive at Kharkov in May 1942, and just prior to the start of the offensive in southern Russia. By this time, Model Cs are becoming the predominant mark of the SPW seen on film. They were to serve on all fronts. Others seen in this footage are serving in France as part of the occupation forces, although most were employed in Russia with the army. Of particular interest is film dating from late 1944, where Model Cs are being employed to train Volkssturm troops in tank destruction, employing magnetic mines and other devices. One of the most important of the SPW subtypes was the 251-3 Funkwagen. This radio command half-track stood at the nexus of a communications net in Panzer and motorised divisions that provided a link to other arms. Employed by senior officers, it had a major command function and to this end was equipped, depending upon the unit it was employed by, with up to eight onboard radios. Frequently employed in this type was the Enigma encoding machine. Funkwagen was clearly distinguishable until 1942 by its prominent frame aerial, thereafter replaced with rod aerials. These SPW Model Cs and motorcycles belonged to the 11th Panzer Division serving in Russia in the winter of 1942-43. Despite the 8-ton weight of the SPW, it was carried with ease by the Messerschmitt 323 Gigant, with a lifting capacity of 22 tonnes, the ME-323 could easily lift both an SPW and a DMAG one-ton half-track. These two half-tracks have been sent to Crete as reinforcements for the German garrison. Although the ME-323 was very slow and highly vulnerable to attacks from Allied fighter aircraft, the Aegean was still beyond the range of British aircraft when this film was shot in early 1943. Four thousand six hundred and fifty of the first three models of the 251 had been produced when, in September 1943, the final model, the D, appeared on the production line. The new body of the model was a major rework, as in the case of its smaller stablemate, the 250, to reduce the number of armour plates and incorporate more flats to ease both the speed and cost of production. The rationalisation led to the emergence of a much cleaner looking machine, wherein many of the awkward angles and more complex features of the first three models had been eliminated. The cowls of the Model C went and the angled rear gave way to a straight plate allowing for an easier rear door arrangement. While weight crept up slightly in consequence of these engineering changes, performance of the SPW was little affected. The new design also left the 251D somewhat longer at 19 feet 7.5 inches. Height remained at 5 feet 9 inches and width at 6 feet 11 inches. 
Although the cross-country performance of the 251 never matched that of a fully tracked vehicle, it was nonetheless able to cope effectively. On a tarmac road, it could reach a maximum speed of 33 miles per hour and used a gallon of petrol for every three to five miles. A total of 10,602 SPWs were produced before war's end, making the Model D the most numerous of all the SPWs and carrying a whole range of weaponry and application to many varied tasks. One of the most useful of these was the 2517 Pioneer Wagen, which mounted two small assault bridges. The 2517 illustrated here is serving with the Waffen-SS Division Viking in Poland, late 44. SPW units discovered early on in the war that it was not always possible to lay hands on heavier armament when confronted with a heavily armed enemy. But experience in Russia forced the need for SPWs to be given their own fire support. The development of a 251 to carry the 75mm L24 cannon was ordered by the Army in 1942, with the first production machines employing the Model C chassis entering service before the end of that year. The identical fitting of the 75mm gun as employed on the C was adopted for the D. Later in the war, a standard mounting for the gun was developed that sat on top of the body. In his inspection of the newly raised 12th SS Panzer Division, Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt stands to examine a 25116, a version of the SPW fitted out to tow 140mm flamethrowers. Later in the sequence, we see a 25116 in action, supporting troops in Holland in the late autumn of 1944. SPWs continued in combat literally to war's end. This footage all dates from the period December 1944 through to March 1945, when the newsreel ceased to record events on the orders of Dr. Goebbels. Most show SPWs in action in the fighting around the city of Budapest in Hungary, and the last abortive German offensive under the code South Wind in January 1945 around Lake Balaton. SPWs pass a destroyed SU-76 as they advance with Panther tanks towards a temporarily retreating Soviet enemy. The last film of 251s was taken as German forces tried desperately to contain the Soviets on the River Oder. The career of the 251 in the German army ended with the last examples fighting in the streets of Berlin in May 1945. While the 5-ton SDKFZ-6 was the first production model of half-track to enter service with the Wehrmacht in 1935 and stayed in production until 1943, its run of just 3,000 reflects that the type was less than fully successful. The problem arose from the fact that it fell between two stools. On the one hand, its principal role was to tow the 105mm howitzer, a task it was found could be handled more than competently by the cheaper 3-ton half-track. Yet, on the other, the 5-ton was not powerful enough to adequately deal with the much heavier 88mm flat gun or the 150mm gun. The first of 12,000 8-ton SDKFZ-7 built by 1944 left the production line of the parent company of Krauss Maffei in 1934. The principal identifying features of the early models of the 8-tonner, namely the KM, M8, 9 and 10, was the four-wheel bogies which resulted in a track length which extended to just over half of the body. The main drive wheel was to be found sighted on the chassis below and slightly to the rear of the driver's compartment on the body, resulting in a significant gap between track and the steering wheels at the front of the machine. The KMM8, which was also constructed by Daimler-Benz and Bussing, remained in production until 1935 could also be identified by the bar that ran midway across and in front of the radiator of the vehicle. Seen here is an example of a KMM10 pulling an 88mm Flak 36 in Russia in 1941. 
The most important model of the SDKFZ7, the KM11, emerged in 1937 and was to remain in production until 1944. It was also built in Austria and Italy. However, it is the KM M10 that is seen in a film released by the Air Ministry entitled Flieger Fluger. This was a major propaganda film showing the growing strength of Goering's Luftwaffe. Coverage is included of a major exercise involving Luftwaffe flak units and gives us a detailed picture of the operations of the 8-ton half-track from the 88mm anti-aircraft gun. A combination that before too long was to acquire a most formidable reputation. The 88mm guns are hitched up to the half-tracks, which are still employing the three-colour camouflage system of grey, green and brown. Having arrived at a pre-selected firing position, the crew dismounts and moves rapidly to unhitch the 88mm gun. This allows us a closer look at the procedure that would be employed on an almost daily basis once the Second World War began, either when the flat gun was being employed in its intended anti-aircraft role or as a deadly anti-tank weapon. Although heavy, the gun is easily deployed by the crew and prepared for action. The approach of aircraft, in this case Dornier 23 bombers, leads to fire being opened. Although the chassis of the 8-ton half-track was to be employed as the basis for self-propelled anti-aircraft weapons carrying the 20mm flak veerling, 37mm Black 36, its principal role throughout the conflict was that of prime mover. While we can see the occasional SDKFZ-7 towing the 105mm howitzer, its primary towing weapon, other than the 88mm Flak, was the different versions of the Army standard heavy artillery piece, the 150mm gun. With much of this immediate footage coming from the opening stages of the Russian campaign, in the summer of 1941, it shows how towed artillery units were required to advance as quickly behind the fast-moving spearheads as was possible. Good communications made it possible for a tank commander to call upon artillery to rapidly deploy and provide fire support off the move and in a short space of time. There can be little doubt that it was this ability to bring heavy artillery fire to bear quite quickly that contributed much to the forward momentum of the German forces in Russia. As the scope and length of the conflict widened to a degree that had never been desired or anticipated by Hitler, the success and effectiveness of the eight-ton half-track led to increasing demands for its supply. This derived particularly from its ability to deal with the severe conditions encountered in Russia and the need for the army to acquire even greater mobility for its limited assets as the war situation declined after 1942. Heavy losses of these machines in North Africa and in Russia could not be made good, even though by 1943 the production lines at Krauss Maffe in Munich were manufacturing 100 SDKF-7s per month. That it was undoubtedly a highly effective machine can be seen in the way that the British, having extensively tested an example seen in the Western Desert, very seriously contemplated putting the type into production for their own armed forces. Other than the self-propelled variants, the 8-tonner was produced essentially as a prime mover. In late 1943 and 1944, a number were built by Krauss Maffei with wooden type truck bodies and were employed carrying heavy loads such as ammunition. A novel employment of the SDKFZ-7 was when a number were converted in 1944 to command vehicles and attached to V2 launching units. Following in the wake of the eight-ton half-tracks towing heavy artillery, passing the dais on which Adolf Hitler was taking the salute, military parade celebrating his birthday in Berlin on April the 20th 1939 came a half-track design originally developed for the Red Army in the early 30s. The medium 12-ton tractor had entered the German army in 1934. The final model, the DB10, entering production in 1939. 
4,000 were manufactured by the parent company and Daimler-Benz, Krauss Maffei and Skoda before production was phased out in 1944. Along with the 8-tonne half-track, the 12-tonne SDK-FZ-8 was the principal prime mover of the 150mm heavy artillery piece. The weight of these pieces, the size of crew needed to serve them, required vehicles of the size and power of the SDK-F7 and 8. But it was the 12-tonne half-track that was employed to move the large 170 and 210mm mortars, their crews and ammunition. Employed at core level, the 170mm K18 Morzelaf was the heaviest standard gun used by the Army, and such was its weight that it was broken down into two sections for travel. Each section employed a 12-tonne half-track. Those seen here are serving in Russia. The latter sequence shows two 12-tonners entering the city of Kiev in August-September 1941. Largest and most powerful of all the half-track prime movers employed by the Wehrmacht was the 18-ton SDKFZ-9, built by Farmo of Breslau. Entering service in 1938, some 2,500 of this type was manufactured before production was terminated in 1944. One of its roles was acting as prime mover for the very heavy artillery pieces. It is in that capacity that two 18-ton half-tracks are seen here being employed to slowly move to its emplacement one of the very large guns mounted by the Germans at Cap Grenay near Calais in northern France in 1940. These were employed to fire at shipping in the English Channel and on coastal towns across the Strait of Dover. But it was as a recovery vehicle that the Farmer was most commonly employed. The heaviest type had a winch capacity of 40 tonnes, while that seen here employed an electric 10-tonne crane. We've alluded to the problems that climatic conditions in the Soviet Union with its seasonal mud and deep snows created for wheeled transport. Two solutions, one a purpose-built response and the other initially an expedient later adopted for mass production, were available by the second winter of the campaign in the form of the fully tracked Raupenschlepper Ost and the Maltier half-track load carriers converted from lorries. The first RSO was in service by late 1942 and was developed by the company of Steyr, who adapted their own standard 1.5-tonne lorry by adding a fully tracked chassis, which was able to cope with the glutinous mud and the deep snows of the Russian winters on an equal basis. The first Maltier was a field conversion, the response of the SS division Das Reich to the conditions in Russia. They married a Card and Lloyd suspension of a captured British Bren carrier to a Ford V8 lorry and produced an impromptu but highly effective half-track load carrier. The idea snowballed and gained official sanction, resulting in full-scale production of the vehicle, including the Card and Lloyd suspension. By the end of 1942, Opel, Majerus and Ford were all producing mules. By 1944, a total of nearly 22,000 three-ton models had been built. The largest of the mules was the four and a half tonner built by Mercedes-Benz and, based on their L4500R lorry, employed a chassis that utilised the track and running gear of the obsolescent Panzer II light tank. A total of approximately 1,500 mules of this weight were produced. Ford built 14,000 two-ton Maltiers by 1944 and RSOs were frequently employed as tractors to pull the 75mm Pack 40. In 1944, the second source of RSOs came online when Klockner Deutz Majerus produced their own model, distinguishable from that of Steyr's by its angular body and diesel engine. By 1945, 25,000 RSOs had been built. Any proper understanding of the German army in the Second World War requires an appreciation of the vital role played by the armoured cars and half-tracks in both her victories and her ultimate defeat.